start a little stiff this morning, just in case y'all didn't recognize that. <laughs> I know, I'm tired too, but amen, let's preach. Hopefully y'all get in on the preaching. That's usually a lot of times that'll happen. We'll be, we'll be a little quiet during worship, and then y'all get in on the preaching. Or we'll be all wild in the worship, and y'all just stare at me like a dead people during the preaching. So I don't know what, you never know what the Lord's going to do. But I want you to go to Romans chapter number one this morning, and we're going to look at something. I, I was going to do something different, but we'll, we'll, we'll just, let's look at Romans chapter 1 this morning, and uh, I want to preach on Wednesday nights, we have been looking at uh, the book of Romans, which is considered the general treatise, if you will, or, or, or the doctrinal treatise, I mean it talks, uh, it, it's for everyone, you can learn a tremendous amount from the book of Romans, anybody could? And uh, I am excited for that uh, and what God's doing on Wednesday nights. Uh, and it's just fun preaching through it, amen. It's the first time we've gone through expositorily. We've done different biblical type things and uh, hip hermeneutics, Bible survey. And now we are exposing the book and looking completely through it. That's what that means. But Romans 1, uh, so if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, you'll hear. Uh, we just taught on these verses a week or two ago. Uh, but I will preach a little bit different, amen, than I do on a Wednesday night. Uh, if you don't come on Wednesday nights, I want you to come. We use a PowerPoint presentation, and I try to show you some things, and we try to grow more as Christians. And I tell them, on a Sunday on Sunday morning, you, I'm going to try and get you excited. I'm going to try and get you fired up to do something. Uh, but there isn't a whole lot of doctrinal learning. There isn't a whole lot of Bible learning. And the more you come on those other services, Sunday, uh, Sunday school and Wednesday nights, you're going to learn more and more. And you're going to be grounded more in the faith, and, and, and there's less likely of a chance for you to be uh, blown about by any wind of doctrine, as the Bible says. Amen. Uh, but I want to look at this uh, for just a couple minutes. I want to preach to you on how to be the greatest soul winner ever. Amen. Any of you interested in being a soul winner? Anybody? Amen. All right, because that's what you're supposed to do. And uh, we'll talk about that for a minute. Uh, but I want to preach on one of the most important subjects that there is when it comes to being a Christian. God gave us what is called the Great Commission. When Jesus Christ was leaving this earth, uh, he, he, he told his men uh, some things, amen? And there are essentially two things inside of that Great Commission uh, that we are supposed to be doing as a church and as individual Christians. Uh, there's all kinds of other things we can tie to it, amen? Uh, loving God, loving your neighbor, that's part of it. Uh, uh, if you love your neighbor, you're going to tell them how to, get, how to get out of a place called hell or not go to a place called hell, amen? If you love God, you're going to do what he commissions you to do, amen? It, it, it all ties together, if you will. Uh, now, there's all kinds of small things we say, but God gave us two major things. And I don't have the verses here for you, but Matthew 28 and 19, you should know these by heart. It's the great commission of the New Testament church. And it says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So our great commission, our mission as a local New Testament body of believers as Christians is to what? Baptize? And to teach. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you get to put on the waders and get in there and baptize them? No. What that's talking about is we ought to be seeing people saved and we ought to be teaching them the book. Amen. What that means is we ought to be soul winning and we ought to be discipling. We ought to be winning souls to Christ and we ought to be teaching doctrine. And I, I, listen, I'm tremendously glad this morning that we believe that in a doctrine of by grace through faith. It's not of works. Listen, the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 8, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. If you was good enough to earn your salvation, you could brag about it. Amen? Uh, which if you believe that way would then be pride and then you'd lose your salvation. Amen? Then you'd have to re-earn it. Then you'd get proud about it. And then you're proud and then you lose it. Then you'd have to re-earn it. I'm glad that I'm saved by the grace of God because I called upon his name and I trusted in him and I believe what he did on the cross of Calvary and I believe he rose from the grave proving he was God and I put enough faith in that to save my eternal soul and realize I was a sinner and I needed salvation and now by the grace of God through my faith in his atoning sacrifice I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Do you believe that this morning? 
good. Because two of the most important works that God gave us was to go out and baptize and disciple. So two of the most important works that Jesus gave us was to be a soul winner and to be a discipler. So if you do happen to sit here this morning and you're thinking, I don't know about all that grace stuff, preacher. I've been raised up that if I go live like hell, I'm going to lose my salvation. Then you're already lost and you're going to burn in hell. When's the last time you saw, when's the last time you soul won somebody? When's the last time you led somebody to Jesus? When's the last time you sat down and discipled somebody in the Word? Probably been a long time. So you're probably sitting there, and if you believe that, you're going to lose your salvation for not doing what God tells you to do. You ain't doing what God told you to do, so you're sitting there lost in the bald high weeds. Am I right? Because right, it's been a while since I've met somebody, Jesus. I'll admit to you, personally. You know, I, I'm a pastor, so I'm forced to disciple. We do that stuff. Uh, but before I was preaching, man, I wasn't grabbing people and discipling them and trying to teach them the Word of God. I wasn't going out soul winning all the time. And if I believed in that heresy of work salvation, I'd be lost. I'm just telling you. Because uh, those are the two most important goals and things that God told us to do. That was our great commission. That is what Jesus has asked us to do. And yet, listen, uh, only 2% Barna Statistics, which is a Christian statistic organization, said only 2% of the church has ever led somebody to Jesus Christ. And discipleship is almost non-existent in most of our New Testament churches. We've started a program. On average, I do not have, listen, I'm not, be, I'm not throwing stones, I'm not beating on nobody. But on average, when we went knocking doors all last year, I'm not on saturation day, we had 17 people, not on other day. But on regular days, even when people were off, even when it was in the evening and you could have went, even when you wasn't on your shift work, there was never more than one or two of us that went door knocking. I'm just saying. Yeah. I've only had a couple people volunteer and say, I will disciple that brand new saved person. And I've had people say, I don't think I ought to do that. I understand we're all working for the greater good. I understand we attend Sunday school. I understand that some of us are Sunday school teachers. I understand you invited people to revival. Thank you so much. I'm not, I, I, I promise I'm not throwing stones this morning. I understand you tied to the church to pay somebody else to do the stuff. I understand you, you participate in faith promise to make sure those missionaries are going over there. And all that's great and good. And you're right. If we run the church correctly, there is a collaborative effort with all of us up to complete the Great Commission. But I believe in uh, the priesthood of the believer and every single one of us ought to be complete the Great Commission. That's teaching people the Bible, and that's leading people to Jesus. I am not happy, I will not be happy, and I don't want you to be happy being the average independent Baptist church. I don't want to be average. I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to have the same meetings everybody else has. I don't want to have the same services everybody else has. But listen, I don't want to be like the church um, in the Bible, my friend. I want to be the church that worships like the people of the Bible. I want to be the church uh, that, that, that prays like the people of the Bible. I want to be the church that fasts like the people of the Bible. I want to be the church that disciples like the disciples in the Bible. I want to be the church that so wins like the soul winners in your Bible. Right. That title one, soul winners. Some people don't like that term because it has been turned in partially negative because people formed a process in which uh, it was a one, two, three, repeat after me, forcing somebody. And, and, and you'd go grab them and you'd say, you want to pray? Will you pray? I'm going to pray with you right now. And you'd grab the back of their head and force their head down whether they want to pray or not and leave them in a sinner's prayer. That person's going to hell, amen? Uh, if there ain't no Holy Ghost conviction in the thing, it ain't no good, all right? Uh, and I, I don't trust that when a man goes out and knocks on doors and says, I had 20 saved today, knocked on 40 doors and 20 of them got saved and went to heaven. I just don't trust it, amen? Uh, and I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost of God has got to do the work but, but he will use you. He will give you divine appointments. But you've got to go try. If you sit and do nothing and you never tell your family, you never tell your co-workers, you never knock on a door, you ain't going to have the opportunity. But if you go out knocking on a door, one man may cut you out, one man may say, I'm going to try.
church down here, but then another man, and you'll know it when it happens fresh and done. When the Holy Ghost of God brings in and somebody truly starts getting convicted, you'll know 100% what's going on, and you'll get to lead that man to Christ, and it'll change his life forever. It'll change your life forever being a part of the Great Commission. So today I want to talk about that soul winning for a minute. It's part of the campaign that we laid out several weeks ago where we used Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Y'all know we tied those four different uh, demographics to different things that we could work on. We talked about the uttermost parts of the earth. So we did the faith promise where we asked you to go above your tithe and to give an offering. The Bible says you have robbed, God said you have robbed me of tithes and offerings. And we heard that preacher say that. And, and, and uh, uh, the offering we said we're going to give towards faith promise. And I took up little cards. Here they are right here in case you missed a couple weeks. But people promised and said, preacher, we'll give this much to missions. They didn't put their name on it. They filled the number out there. They checked it. They took it off so they could put it on their fridge and remember how much to put on their tithe check. And it ain't got to be hard. Just, just add it to your tithe and right on the bottom, so much towards missions. And, 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 and they took that home. And, and listen, we send out $1,400 a month to missionaries. Not sure how many that is. Uh, just to buy that by we send most of them 50 bucks a piece. Somebody do the math. 28. We probably got around 28 missionaries right now in the Philippines, in Africa, in all these different places. We asked for faith promise. Guess how much y'all promised? Guess how much y'all vowed? I promise you. To the exact number. The number was a little bit inflated at first, but then after some things, to the exact number. Guess how much y'all promised? Anybody want to take a guess? 1400 You know what that does? Right now, we, we, we can take care of all of our missionaries with that giving towards missions. What that means is next year, if we do more, we can take on more missionaries. And we got one guy who may be coming off the field, which means we'll be able to pick up Mike Blake to the prison ministries who I like. We'll be able to pick up Ramil Aprecio, who is a Filipino missionary, who I like and know. We can pick up one of these local, worldwide, or nationwide evangelists, like some of my friends, if we want to. We decide on that as a, as a leadership team. Uh, but we can pick more people up and be more and more involved in reaching the uttermost part of the world. Uh, and we can take that added that we was using, that right there makes enough money for a part-time youth leader, does it not? That right there makes enough money to possibly pay for radio program, does it not? Yeah. Because you found exactly what we need to pay for the missions. Now let me just read the verse to you real fast. Ecclesiastes 5 and 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, which is exactly what you did, you didn't make the promise to me, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So Jim said, I've been doing this for a while, and oftentimes you may get 70% of that number. You may get 50% of that number. But I'm praying that y'all understood this thing and we did it right. I'm praying $1,400 comes in every single month for admission. Yeah. Or I'll just keep posting Ecclesiastes 5 and 4 unless you read that. <laughs> when thou vowest to vow unto God, and defer not to pay it, for it hath no pleasure in fools. Amen. Then we talked about Samaria. We've spoken with the man for radio station. We got a spot. Now, if it's still held, if he's still got it, I believe God's going to pay for that and take care of that as well. We talked about Judea. We've got, uh, we talked about a youth pastor, and we've got uh, a bus route, but we can, we got a bus that's ready to go. We've got four men going to a conference, and we're praying that God makes that thing start running within a month. Uh, then we talked about Jerusalem, where we said uh, the strategy was each one reach one. Now, I want to take it upon myself as pastor to do the best that I can. I haven't done it for three years, but I want, we want to teach. And Rue and Kevin, as leaders of this church, we're going to teach how we can reach one. 
We're going to preach serious sermons on Sunday nights on how uh, to be better witnesses for Jesus Christ. We're going to try to help you. We're going to teach Sunday school uh, to the teenagers and to the adults. And maybe even in Miss Carter's class on how we can be better witnesses for Jesus Christ. And how each one of us can reach somebody. If everybody in this room takes this great commission serious and helps someone come to know Jesus, imagine what could happen around here. More than likely, you're sitting in those seats due to the effort of somebody. They either invited you to church, either some parents taught you about Jesus, a preacher got in the pulpit and preached, somebody, somebody followed the Great Commission and gave you the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I want to talk about how to become the greatest soul winner ever. I don't believe I have it in my notes, but I posted it on Facebook, but nobody liked it. I don't know if that means y'all didn't want to come today, or if, no, if I posted it at the wrong time of the day. But here's the fact. They say Billy Graham possibly reached 2.5 billion, billion people throughout his ministry. Right? That was the, the most inflated statistic I could find. He probably reached through his campaigns, through his ministries, through his television, through all that stuff, probably reached 2.5 billion people. You know how many people on the earth right now? 7.5 billion people. You know how many people profess to be Christians right now? 2.19 billion people. If that two points was, I, I believe that we have taken this thing and we're searching for the anointed one. Billy Graham in 100 years led 2.5 billion people to Jesus. We're searching for the one that's going to bring revival. We're searching for this. When if the church would just do what Jesus Christ told us to do, we wouldn't need it. Right. Honestly, right. revival starts in the individual. And if each one of us got revived and led people to Jesus, and, and the church became revived, and, and listen, uh, me and Justin Cooper talked on the phone last night for an hour and a half, and, and, and he said, listen, I feel passionate everywhere I go. If the church was honestly doing their job, I'd be out of work. We wouldn't need an evangelist. Because the church would be on fire and we'd be winning souls. If every one of them 2.19 billion people just tried to win somebody to Christ for four days straight, we'd have the entire world evangelized and Jesus would come back. Yeah. Yeah. Am I wrong? Right, right. 2.19 billion saved, right. supposedly. Now, y'all know how I feel about that. Probably half of me. But 2.19 billion professing saved and 7.5 billion in the world. If every one of us tried to win people to Christ, What's going to happen? In a week or two, man, we got to, everybody going to know about Jesus, which I believe is when Jesus is going to come back. So we want to talk about being the greatest soul winner ever. I, and listen, I wasn't talking bad about Billy Graham at all. What he did in 100 years was awesome. But if the church rise up and do what, listen, Peter preached, he was the anointed one at the time. He preached, 3,000 got saved. And then in the next couple verses in the book of Acts, the church began to be the church and go door to door daily and broke bread and they added to the church daily. You see what I'm saying? If those 2.5 billion that he wrecked were adding to the church daily, there's only 7.5 billion people in the world. You understand what I'm saying. I know y'all staring at me funny, but you understand what I'm saying. We're going to look at Paul. In my opinion, of course, I am O. Apart from Jesus Christ himself, the Apostle Paul is the greatest soul winner ever to live. I want to look at the introduction in the book of Romans that we've already studied on Wednesday nights and look at five verses that some say contain the greatest summary of the gospel ever given that I believe is the key to the reason that the Apostle Paul was the greatest soul winner ever. So notice with me three key things Paul knew and understood that made him a soul winner that if you and I would get a hold of, I'm not giving you tactics, I'm not giving you tricks, I'm just telling you a couple things that if you and I would get a hold of in our hearts and in our minds and truly believe would make us some of the greatest soul winners that's ever lived because we'd be on fire for soul winning. So let's pray and then we're going to read these. Lord, I love you. 
God, I, I thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do. God, I ask you, Lord, make us a church. God, I ask you to work in my heart and my soul. Make me a soul winner, God. I feel like a failure, God, just like Brother Nathan said a minute ago. I'm a failure as well, God. I have not done what I should. I have not said it enough. I have not spread it enough. I don't have the burning urgency inside of me that I should, God. And I ask you, Lord, implant that in us, every single one of us in the room. But God, remind us of what you've done for us and the debt that we owe to this world. But God, remind us how wonderful it is. God, remind us, God, give us the, the plan to deliver it. God, help us, Lord, to be soul winners. God, help us, Lord, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask you to help us today. And in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Look at verse number 14. This is the introduction to the church of Rome. He said this, I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. That's where I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We ain't to preach this last verse in Wednesday yet. Uh, but it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Lord, help us. Let me show you a couple things real fast and we'll go home. Number one, I believe Paul realized his debt. You'll realize your debt this morning. Your soul in an effort to change. He said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. The people he's talking to, that, that, would, that would sum up everybody in the world. If you wasn't a Greek, they'd believe you the barbarian. It didn't matter who you was. Uh, so he said, I'm a debtor to every single person in the world, both the wise and the unwise. What he's saying is uh, he was indebted to the world to spread the gospel to all and everyone that he ever saw. There's no person he'd leave without the gospel. Whether it was a slave named Onesimus or whether it was a king named Agrippa, we see him do it to both. Yeah. Every single person he came in contact, I guarantee you, he delivered the gospel. He handed him a track, and half of us don't even carry tracks in our pockets. He was bound by a duty. He was obligated. He owed it to him. Let me just add this in here. This ain't even in my notes. You ought to carry a track in your pocket. I got a thousand of them downstairs that says, do you know that you're going to heaven? You need to grab a stack of them sitting on that back for you today. You need to put them in your pocket and you need to carry them with you. And you need to learn to hand them out and talk to people about that. Amen. Uh, we also got the little ones that's got our church name on it. Uh, got all that. Got the plan of salvation on the back. You need to learn to carry them at all times and hand them to people. I was at the beach. Listen, and I, one of them guys, I think I told y'all, it may not have been on Sunday morning, I can't remember, but dude wanted to sell me a cruise. I said, no. I said, I don't want to be a part of one of that. I got a buddy that's a part of one of that, and, and, and I'll just work with him. Amen. I don't need to do that. I ain't signed up for that. And, and, and listen, I'm a pastor. I ain't got enough money uh, to go to the window every, every month or two and earn a bunch of I can't do it. And he's like, all right, man. I said, now, I gave you your minute. Give me my minute. And I began to witness to this fellow. And I said, I said, listen, have you ever been saved? What's your church background? I started talking to him about church. And I started telling him I was a drunkard. And, and that's my, that, that, I go straight into my testimony. I said, listen, I was a drunk. I was an alcohol. I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. And I told him the entire gospel. And I said, well, will you read this track? Will you take this home? He wasn't ready to accept it. And he was standing there at work, you know, standing by his little thing. And I'm like this, looking around, and we was on vacation. I'm like, man, I, I, I forgot. And, and I got mad at myself, and I walked off there, and I come on the car, and she's coming out of New York to cut me in one of these places. And I said, honey, uh, hold on one second. I started Googling, and I found Romans Road in the King James Version Bible on Google Images. And I walked up there, and I said, hey, can I get your text number? I want to send you something. He said, sure. And I texted him a track right there, amen. Starting new ministries right there. We're going to design a track. We're going to design an app that you can uh, shoot stuff to people on. Amen. Uh, but what I'm telling you is you ought to be ready all the time to share that gospel. But uh, Paul knew it was his duty. Paul knew it was his obligation. Paul knew he owed it to them. Uh, the, the idea is that he had an intense, unwavering, unrelentless, powerful feeling of indebtedness inside of him that compelled him to tell everybody about Jesus. You got that this 
morning. Do you? Because I, I mean, I don't half the time. Let's be real. Here's what uh, one fellow said. Paul felt an obligation to all men, just as we need to feel a burden for the whole world. Paul could not be free from his debt until he had told as many people as possible the good news of the salvation of Christ. I wonder why Paul felt that indebtedness to the world to give them the gospel of Christ. Amen. How many of you are glad you're saved this morning? How many of you are glad that he took you off the dope? He took you off the alcohol? He saved your marriage. He does what he does in your life. How many of you are glad you can go to the funeral home and still be uh, all right with the Lord because you know where somebody went? How many of you are glad you're going to a place called heaven? Amen. Uh, we are indebted because of what Jesus did for us. I can't help but thank Paul. He said, Thinking, I'm indebted to Christ to spread this gospel because of the debt he paid in my life. Every man in this room was born with a debt hanging over their head that you could not pay. Amen. If we realize that debt, we'd all be so winning machines. Uh, you see, the fact of the matter is, having seen in the garden, you know the story. Adam sinned, and every single man born since him had that debt of sin in their life hanging over their head. And the debt of sin is what brings death into a man's life. It is what real death is. When a Christian dies, Billy Graham stated it. He said, when you hear I died, don't you even believe it for a minute. I'm just in, in heaven at home, something like that, something or other. He said, I didn't die, the Christian man, the saved man does not die this morning. But the lost man dies an eternal death. The man that does not know Jesus dies and burns in a devil's hell and dies daily and all the time for the rest of eternity. Because of that death of sin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We take care of that sin by getting saved. So here you are, lost man, carrying the debt, the worst debt that you could ever carry. The, what, what's number one fear? Y'all ever Googled it? Number one fear of man is death. So here's the lost world carrying the debt of death. The scariest thing they'll ever carry. <coughs> and it's a debt that we can't take care of ourselves. We can't pay for it, am I right? The richest in the man, man in the world have to pay that debt. I didn't know any old rich man, so I had to pick some that are still alive. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, if they ain't saved, they have to pay the debt themselves. And it's debt. You understand that? The kings of this world still have to pay that debt. Napoleon, uh, whoever else, Adolf Hitler, they pay the debt on their own. Most famous men of the world are going to have to pay that debt. Elvis, he was a king too, though, wasn't he? He had to pay that debt. If he wasn't saved, he had to pay that debt. I know we sang gospel, but every now and then. The most intelligent men in the world will have to pay that debt themselves. Darwin, Einstein. They say Darwin recanted on his on his on his deathbed, saying there's got to be a higher power. I don't know that he called upon Jesus. And the fact of the matter is we can't pay that debt. But y'all remember that verse that I've been quoting and or been been reading and that Brother Brent preached on? And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of the flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against you. That's an Old Testament debt. Wiping away the debt that you owe, which was contrary to us, and what's that verse say? And took it and nailed it to the cross. He took your debt and through his son Jesus nailed that debt to the cross. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did stream him sick and stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed, with his stripes. If we could, listen church, if we could just get a hold of the fact this morning that Jesus was a real man like you and me. He was God, but he came as a man, right? He's here, he'd sit right beside us. 
We call them skull fatty, make you left side so they wouldn't make your chest dry and everything else. But, okay, we are. but Jesus was here. And we looked right at him. And he was beaten beyond recognition, the Bible says. He was betrayed by his brethren, spit in his face, beard plucked out, every joint pulled out of socket. A crown of thorns was placed on his head beaten in the head with a stick and he died the most vicious form of death ever invented to pay my debt you hear me pay my debt because I'm a sinner because I do wrong that's what he did and I don't know how many of you look at the stuff on the internet but there's not much of it now because my boy Trump done took care of him but when ISIS was killing everybody, and you'd look on Facebook, if you got on there at the right time, you could actually see an actual video of one of them beheading a Christian, or one of them hanging somebody on a cross, because one of them had a bunch of kids in a cage and set them on fire. And I look at them videos, and I, I wouldn't watch them because I feel more of I'm one of them guys. I won't even watch the zombie garbage you are hooked on. I won't watch nothing that deals with after death. I won't watch CSI. I won't watch nothing with gore at all. It makes me sick of my stomach because I've trained myself to be like that. I quit watching a long time ago. And if you can sit and watch that stuff where people blow their brains out and stuff oozing out their head that don't bother you at all, check it up. Take that junk out of your life because it bothers me. It's morbid. That's why kids ain't scared of hell, because they play video games and blow heads off all day long. Right. That's why kids are shooting at school, because they play video games and blow heads off all day long. I'm just saying, I'm sorry boys, Call of Duty is probably not the right thing to play in all night long for 13 hours straight. Get your blood turned on and everything. But he bore our sins. And when I watch videos of real men, on YouTube, does it not make you completely sick at your stomach? Does it not like turn you inside like when you see it really happen? I mean, it does me. When you see it really happen, you ever seen a real hanging? I ain't trying to be too, too, whatever they call it, grotesque or too. You ever seen a real death on video? Crucifixion? When ISIS is doing it, I can't watch it. It turns my stomach. But if we get a hold of the fact that Jesus went through worse than any one of them would ever go through, and Jesus paid it all for you and I. Jesus did every single bit of that. Jesus, listen, was beaten to death. He was beaten beyond recognition. You couldn't even tell who he was. He hung on a cross and died. Listen, hey, he went through it all. He paid the most vicious form of death. He, he was paying that death to pay the death for you and I. Yeah, amen. And if we really realized that and cared, you think it'd be hard for us to say, hey, man, Jesus died for you too. You think it'd be hard to go to work and say, Jesus died for you too. You think it'd be embarrassing or ashamed for one of you teenagers to go to school and say, hey, let me tell you, Jesus died for you. If we realize, if we, if we realize the debt he paid for us. What did this song say? The sum is just a fairy tale. Is that what it said? I'll just tell you this. Half of us is just a fair tale. We put our faith and trusted it and believed it, but when you read the Bible, it's just story. <laughs> when you read about him dying for you, it's just a story. You read, you've heard Luke 2 your whole whole life, born the birth, and then you've read the crucifixion every Easter. But it means nothing to you. If we realize the debt that he paid for us. We would be, we are indebted to this world to spread the gospel. Now, what if you was the one that that debt was never, you never knew that debt was paid? What if you never knew? What if nobody delivered it to you? 
God entrusted you with the Bible. What's that series you did? Entrusted. God entrusted you with the gospel by saving your soul. Now, what if you was the one out there that you see every day and you ain't told them about that debt that was paid? John Currier, a man in 1948, was sentenced to prison for murder. It was a self-defense murder, and he got sentenced to life. And as they looked at it later on in 1968, they decided uh, he was paroled to a farm. He went to a farm and worked as a parolee there, uh, still in chains, still had to do everything he was told, still wasn't a free man, and he suffered in bondage for his uh, for all those years. Then in 1968, uh, they had paroled him earlier to the farm in 1968. They looked at it, and I don't know if they found more evidence or what it was, but they said, you know what? Your sentence is terminated. They said you're no longer uh, have to live on a parole. You are free to go. You are, by, you are released from your chains. And they sent him a letter in the mail. Guess what? The letter never got there. People heard about it later. The police heard about it 10, 15 years later. And for 10 or 15 years, that man served in chains doing gruesome labor on a work farm in the 1960s or 70s when he should have been free. But the letter wasn't delivered. Every one of you safe folks is holding the letter this morning. You got somebody at work that's bound up by alcohol, bound up in chains. Their life's falling apart. You're just sitting there holding a letter saying, I don't know if I'll get to Am I right? No. We're just sitting there holding the letter. You see the poor girl working at Dairy Queen, and you know, you can tell she's rough, she's all, you can just tell. You can tell her life's hard. You can hear her talking about the things she's going through. You're sitting there eating your little ice cream, your banana split. Maybe even with a chuck in your pocket, but you're just too busy to even tell her. You're too busy to even deliver the letter to her. I want to be a soul winner. I want to tell people about Jesus. I don't deserve what he did for me. What do you think, church? Don't you think we ought to be soul winners? As song we sang said, and when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died to save my soul. My lips will still repeat, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. If we realize the debt, church, you'd be a soul winner. Secondly, Paul was ready to deliver. He was ready to deliver. What's Romans 15 say? For as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel. To you there in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We go on that Wednesday night. Most of us are ashamed of it. We're embarrassed of it. For it is the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because of his realization of the debt he owed to this world and the debt that was paid for him and the debt that he owed, he said, with everything in me, look at the verse, for as much as is in me, every ounce of energy I have, everything that I have, everything that's in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel. In Strong's Concordance, that means ready to announce the good news. That word ready means eager. He was eager to announce the good news of what Jesus can do. I said it earlier, but we believe in a priesthood of the believer. That sounds weird saying all of us are priests, especially when we don't believe in women preachers, but all that means is that we're called to spread the gospel. 1 Peter 2 and 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's some other benefits, but one benefit of being a believer priest is that we can show forth the praises of him that brought us out of darkness. Every single one of us ought to be ready to tell somebody about Jesus. 1 Peter 3 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. 
We talked about this on another night, but at Sun Trust Bank, as I managed it for 12 years and sold investments and all that junk, I had an elevator speech. What that is is a 30 second speech using an elevator with a man uh, that had a couple million dollars. You ought to be able to tell them as a banker why they ought to bank at Sun Trust and why they ought to bank with you. And in 30 seconds, as the elevator goes up from the first floor to the fifth floor, I, I was supposed to be able to be trained to tell them why. And, and, and I, I'd have to give a, I think I, I had to get up and give a speech on in front of a thousand people. It's crazy. I hate talking in front of people. I hate it. Y'all know before I preached, I never testified, I never prayed, I never spoke in front of anybody. And uh, the elevator speech was something like Sun Trust Bank, six largest bank in the nation. We have 88 million in assets. And uh, uh, what that means is we're a large scale bank that can give you the internet capabilities and the different things you need. But we have a small town atmosphere. We're a southern bank, we're a country bank. We know you by name. You're not a number like you are at Chase or Bank of America. And I will know who you are when you walk around that corner and come to the bank with me. I'll know you. I'll probably know the last four digits of your social security by heart. Couldn't help but I had a memory. Uh, I'll probably know your birthday. I'll, I'll, I'll know how much money you got. I'll know all that stuff. So why should you bank with me? Because I've been doing it 12 years and I've been in the top 2% of the nation. And, and I promise you, I'm, I'm ethical, I'm a Christian, and everything about me, I'm going to take care of your money the best I can. So I was able to do that. Could you do that for Grace Gospel Baptist Church in Jesus Christ in 30 seconds in an elevator? Honestly. Could you? So, we taught two years ago, we did our vision Sunday, our main one, and casted a vision statement for the church which is to encapsulate everything we do, right? You remember the vision statement? Grace Gospel Baptist Church, uh, helping people know, serve, and love Christ. So you could jump in that elevator and say, hey, man, you ought to come down to Grace. We're, we're a place we love seeing people saved. We help people know how to know Jesus and how to be saved and go to heaven. We help people serve, man. We try to disciple them. We try to teach them everything about a Bible, out of the Bible that's going to help their life and make their life easier. And we try, we worship Jesus Christ. We love to give him praise. We love to have a good time. And we're a family. We take care of each other. We love each other. We call each other when we're sick. We go see each other in the hospital. And, and man, it's something like you'll never find on earth or anywhere else at Grace Gospel Baptist Church. You ought to be able to say it just like that. But then you also ought to be able to say, and we serve a risen Savior named Jesus Christ that died on the cross for my sins. He saved me from some stuff. We all got different testimonies. I know that. Some of you never lived in sin. But you still ought to be able to say, and Jesus Christ saved me because of what he did on the cross and the debt that I owe because of what Adam did in the garden. I was a sinner. I knew how to lie. But Jesus died for me. And when he saved me, he came into my heart. And I've got a peace that passes all understanding now. I've got a peace and I've got a home in heaven. And he saved me. Why Jesus? Because he's the good news of the power of salvation. What does 16 say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. If you're saved, you ought not be embarrassed or ashamed to spread the gospel of Jesus. Because of the simple fact that you know the power of salvation. Do you know it this morning? You know the fact that one day uh, you, were, you were saved from sin that had you shackled up. You know the fact that one day you were saved from sin that had a guilt and shame in your life. You couldn't hardly even live with yourself. You hated yourself because of the guilt and the shame that you had to bear with. Uh, you, you know the power of the gospel because one day uh, you were saved from a lost man's condition and put in a saved man's condition. You know the power of the gospel because you were saved uh, from the devil and his demonic assaults and attacks. He still comes at you. But now you've got a hedge of protection around you. Uh, Jesus Christ helping you. One day you were saved from the wrath of God that's coming on this world. And the gospel is the power to save. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Listen, I believe there's a power to save anyone, anywhere, anytime from anything. Yeah. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you ready to deliver that message right now? Are you? Are you ready to give your testimony on a moment's notice? When your child has that moment of conviction where God and uh, the Holy Ghost is convicting them and they walk in the bedroom and they pull out Romans Road and begin to read it and say, Mommy, tell me about Jesus. Tell me how to be saved. Are you ready to tell them? Or are you going to have to say, Hold on, let me call a pastor. 
Are you ready? When you accidentally keep on that other car and you run to it because you're not hurt at all and they're laying there dying and you've got them in your arms in the middle of the street and they're dying. Are you ready to tell them about Jesus? Are you ready? Somebody you love laying in that hospital bed gasping for air. You don't know them ever living a testimony for Jesus. Are you ready to witness to them right then and right there? You're going to be ashamed of the gospel. I'll never forget the day my grandmother, my mama's mom, who never really had a Christian testimony. This was months before she actually died, but she was having all these problems. And all of a sudden, she went straight down here. When the days noticed she was in the hospital room, the emergency room, on the bed, I was a brand new Christian. I was a brand new Christian. I didn't have no training. I didn't know how to get to God. I didn't know nothing. And I remember walking in there that day. See, my grandma that I loved, I mean, she lived beside me. It was one of the grandmas she was with every single day. It was one of the grandmas that on your 15th, 16th birthday, she knew you had a smoking problem, so she'd buy you a carton of cigarettes and hide them at her house and not tell your mom that. <laughs> Go, Red! <laughs> and uh, I walked in there and saw her guest. People have never been on a ventilator. Probably people that have been on before that are alert. It kind of gags you and makes you, and, and, and it'll put you in a panic state. And she's sitting there panicking with fear in her eyes. I woke in, I didn't know what to say, what to do. I was young. I, I thought my grandma was dying. The only thing I knew to say was, Grandma, I just want to know what you're saying. Grandma, I just want to know what you know, Jesus. Grandma, do you know he died on the cross for you? And if you'll just ask him to save you, then your heart right now to save you. And I looked at Grandma with the fear in her eyes. And I told tears began to trickle down her cheek. I said, Grandma, do you know him? Grandma, are you saved? Have you asked him? She began to shake her head. Yes and no. And it broke my heart, man. Looking at her, not knowing. And I had to tell her. How about you this morning? Are you ready? Will you tell her? You better be ready to share the gospel in your testimony. Study the story very well, so I'm going to sit up. But I was reading Cody's pre sharp before. I was reading about the Titanic. There was a man named John Harper on that boat, the unsinkable ship. He was on his way to D.L. Mooney to Mooney Church to be their new pastor, from what I read, in Chicago. And he was on the boat, and his six year old little girl was with him. And as they took off, they got on there, they, they they're leaving and all of a sudden everything starts happening. That boat starts to go down. They say John Harper, uh, a preacher of the gospel, grabbed his little daughter who had a salvation testimony and took her and put her on the boat. And sure enough, him being a widow, widower, he could have got on the boat with her, but instead put his little girl on the boat and began to run and uh, began to run to the different people and say, you must be born again. He began to preach the gospel to them. And I, I'm not sure exactly what verse he was saying, but he kept saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, running to different people in the boat saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they say, all of a sudden the boat did sound like an explosion. Uh, but if you've ever read the story, it was the boat cracking in two. And as it cracked in two, uh, people plummeted into the water, 1,500 people floating in that icy cold uh, water and uh, they said John Harper was swimming around the different people and he found a man that rejected the gospel and he took all his life vest and said here you need this more than me and he got out and said believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved they said he swam up to one man and asked him gave him the gospel and the man said no and he swam off to another man and he told him and the Lord did he come back to the man again and said, do you believe now? We you be saying the man said, I just can't. No, I can't. And he swam off and he told others. And the hypothermia took over and 
John Harper, as he's telling the gospel to his last dying breath, begins to sink miles down under the water. And that man that he told about the gospel, his testimony is after John Harper died and sunk to the bottom, he began to weep and cry and call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. And four years later, had a meeting for the survivors of the Titanic. They let that man speak, and he stood up with tears rolling down his eyes. He said, I'm saved because of the testimony. I was the last convert of John Harper. I'm asking you this morning, will you be a John Harper? Will you be ready to deliver the gospel? Paul was ready to deliver. He was ready to deliver. Lastly, he recognized the difference. He recognized there was a difference. Look at verse 17 and we'll be done this morning. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's saved by the justified. We talked about that Wednesday. We didn't talk about verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You see, Paul recognized that in this world there's only two classes of people. There's the lost and saved. You know what it said the day after the death of Titanic went down? There was something... Here's what the article said. When the Titanic set sail, there was a delineation of three classes of passengers. Probably first class, coach, whatever. Yet immediately after the tragedy, the White Star Line in Liverpool, England, placed a board outside the office with only two classes of passengers reading. Known to be saved, known to be lost. Now that wasn't talking about eternal salvation, but to us who know a difference, with the Apostle Paul, who know there's a difference, there were those that were lost and those that were saved. We realize this morning that there's either the just saved by faith and living by faith, or there's the ungodly and unrighteous who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Listen, everybody you know and love, everyone in this room either falls into one category or the other. And we stated it earlier, you don't jump back and forth between the categories. You fall in one category or the other. And one day, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on those that do not come by the way of the cross. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Come help me, Ruth. If a man dies knowing Christ, if man dies not knowing Christ, he's going to burn in the devil's hell forever. Luke said it's complete, it's complete consciousness. You'll know you're in hell. It's eternal remorse. It's torment. Matthew said it's weeping and gnashing of teeth, a furnace of fire, outer darkness. John said it's eternal misery, a lake of fire, everlasting burning. Could you imagine? we got to get a hold of the fact that the people we love, listen, the people we love are going there. They may have had a time in their life they profess. I, I, I don't know all that. You, they can sort all that out with God. But I know if there's a chance of somebody I know and love not being saved, we better go and tell them. Do you agree? Amen. Do you agree? There's going to be people in hell that thought they were going to heaven. Do you believe that? The Bible says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not caught sight of thy name? What can we say? Just say, depart from me, you work so thick. I believe that'll be the works crowds, people that thought they were earning it. Did we not do this? Did we not do this? It's talking about works. Didn't we cross out your name? Did, didn't we do this? Didn't we cast out devils in thy name?
Brother Donald, well, yeah, he uses men like that to set a fire and do things. I believe that. But he called the local New Testament church for each and every one of you to deliver that letter. One last illustration of three plays. I got all the Titanic stuff to start reading, so I couldn't help it. On the Titanic, there was 20, I believe, like, okay? As it began to sink, or as the alarm was sounded, it was so large, many didn't even know what was going on, what was going on. But out of those 20 light boats, I, I didn't have time to print off all the statistics, but out of those light boats, they should have been able to hold 1,200 people, 1,500 died in the water. They should have been able to hold 1,200 people right around that. Yet only 700 people were saved on those light boats. Those light boats, most of them were less than halfway full. And I'm going to tell you, I, I, I never noticed this until today. This is going to be a new illustration I use, Carl. Two of the reasons, I hope I can come up with more to help me. Two of the reasons that people didn't get on it. One is because the captains thought that possibly those light boats weren't built properly and couldn't hold the weight of the full 20 or 30 people they were supposed to hold. You know how they got them on the two ropes on them old ships and they lowered them down. They were afraid they would crack right in the middle. So they did not trust what the light boat could do. How many people you know just won't trust what Christ could do? They just won't put their faith and trust in anything. You, know, you don't know why they won't get saved. You try over and over. They just don't trust him to save them. They didn't trust what that life book could do. They trust what Jesus can do in their lives. I'm having a hard time remembering the second. Here's the deal. As them light boats went out, <clears throat> they all dropped. They began to row out away from the carnage. And as that bro boat broke in two, pop! 1,500 people in the freezing cold water died. All them boats rowed out. There's a lady that tells a story about it. You can read it online. Those boats rolled out just without a distance. Pitch dark in the middle of the night, freezing cold in their boat. They couldn't really see. They could see the lights on the ship of it going down. 1,500 people floating in that water, drowning, going under. As they're going under, they're sitting at a safe distance, half full, all those extra seats. Some say they were scared that if they went into the carnage, that their boat would be overwhelmed and everybody would grab on and people would try to get in there and it would sink their boat and kill them all. So they stayed at a safe distance. One woman says all she could hear was the screams and the wails and the moans people died in the water. There was one faithful boat, like boat 14, that rode back to the wreckage and went back and said, we're going to help you. people, we're going to save everybody we can. They went back and started pulling people in and filled their boat up. Here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. Grace Gospel Baptist Church is going to be like Book 14. There's a world out there. There's people you know and love that's drowning in the water. Moaning and screaming. Their lives are so bad. Their lives are wrecked. Yet many of us are sitting in other boats just looking over at them. Scared to get ourselves in danger. Scared to get too close. How many of you want to be?
Jesus is like one of 14 this morning. How many of you want to be the one that's ready to preach the gospel? How many of you want to be the one that's ready to tell the gospel? Here's what I want to ask you to do. Basically, the last part of our vision, I'm probably going to preach. Each one, each one. How many of us this morning will say, I want to be like Bo 14? I don't want my uncle or aunt to burn in hell. I don't want my kids to burn in hell. I don't want my mom and dad to burn in hell. I don't want the drunk Mary Queen to burn in hell. I don't want my barber to live a life without God. I don't want my doctor to live a life without God. And I will be like Lord 14. That's what he did for me. How many of you get on off to this morning and just come in and say, I'm going to be that? I'll be a soul winner. I'm going to come to church and learn how to teach people to be saved. I'm going to come to those sermon series that Pastor does and teach us to be witnesses. I'm going to come to that Sunday school and learn to be a soul winner. I'm going to carry a tract. I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. How many of you come right now and say, Preacher, I'll do it. Preacher, I'll be there on Saturday. Preacher, I'll be there Saturday. Preacher, I'll knock on a door. Preacher, I'll serve him. Preacher, I know the commission's for me. Sing a verse, Ruth. Let's pray. Lord, I ask you, God, to help us commit in faith this morning, God. God, I ask you, help us, God, to commit to be soul winners. To commit to be people, God, who share, God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us, God, this morning, realize the debt that was paid. God, help us this morning, realize what you did on the cross. And, God, we are indebted to Ripley. God, we are indebted to Jackson County. God, we are indebted to West Virginia to spread the gospel. Maybe you're in here 
this morning. If you've never realized that urgent need, but you were the one that's drowned in it. You don't know him. You've never asked him to save you. Maybe everybody thinks you have. Maybe, maybe you've lived. Maybe you're a good kid. Maybe you're a good person. But you know right now in your heart, for some reason you're scared. You realize you're without Jesus. You realize you're the one drowning. The best thing you can do this morning is make sure that you're saved. Everything I preach, although I was preaching to the church, applies to you. There's a debt on your life and you can't pay it. But God paid it for you. If you call upon him this morning and just put your faith and trust, you know it all. You've been around long enough. You just heard it this morning. If you'll just believe he died for you, believe you're a sinner, and he died for your sins, and he rose from the grave, and say, Jesus, I'm making you my Savior this morning. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. He'll save you. If that's you this morning, would you? Nobody's looking. Just slip your hand up. Say, it's me, preacher. I need to get saved. Maybe you'll slip your hand up and say, preacher, I've been playing a game for a long time. Preacher, I've been playing it real good. But I know I need to get saved this morning. It's me, your point head preacher. Anybody in the room? Don't you miss your chance when God's dealing with your heart. Preacher, it's me. I'll give you an opportunity. That's you. The Holy Ghost of God's dealing with your heart. You know you need to get right. Ruth's going to sing a verse of this song. Won't you come accept Jesus this morning? Come on. Go, Ruth. Come accept him. Don't let pride keep you in that seat.
I know you may not be completely prepared. We haven't trained right. We haven't done everything we should. You may not be completely prepared, but I want you to uh, take some of those. And the least you could do is say, hey, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I hear Grace Gospel. Let me give you this track. It tells you how to be saved. A deacon in our church was handed a track one day like that. He went home, and I don't know the entire testimony, but he went home and read that track. Right there with his heart, he got saved. Amen. Amen. So grab some tracks on the way out. Press and hand them to you. Come on, Brother Jim. Let's take this morning's offering. I think I'd have.